Welcome to Medical Myths, Legends, and Fairy Tales. I'm your host, Dr. Alan Christensen. Look, you know that between the latest online fads and the crazy media headlines, it's easier than ever to get confused about your health. And you and I just want to feel better and live longer. We want to know what works. And we can't wait for further studies. We need to make decisions today based on the best evidence we've got. Well, that's exactly what this show is here for. So let's get to it. Hey, Dr. C here with you. You know, after the talk I gave on pesticides and the interview that I had with Stephen Savage, I got a lot of questions about it and also about glyphosate and GMOs. So those are worth a few episodes and I'll spend several episodes on those. i uh, talking to a lot of people on both sides of that debate. Here's a good discussion I had with Robert Syke. So Robert's an agrologist and a professional agricultural consultant. He's been a agricultural entrepreneur, futuristic thought leader. He's put together many large companies in agribusiness distribution, and he's not part of what you would call the big farm conspiracy. He's not tied to Monsanto, but he's followed this industry for quite some time. And he's a knowledgeable researcher in this with some uh, very powerful ideas that he wanted to share with us. So he and I had a great talk about this, and I, I love your feedback and love to hear further questions and comments. Uh, Robert and I plan to do a follow-up discussion as well. So whatever things we left open that weren't clear, any points that he made that didn't quite make sense, please give me feedback and I'll bring those into our follow-up discussion. But here's a great starting talk with Robert Syke. Hey, Dr. C here with you again, another episode, and I'm joined by Robert Syke. Hey, Robert, thanks for joining me here. Hey, so so appreciate your time on this. So just tell me a bit about what led your, what guided your interest in GMOs? What made this become a topic of interest of yours? You know, how did that all come about? Well, I'm a professional agrologist, and for 20 years I, I ran a consulting firm where we provided advice to farmers in the area of agronomics and grain marketing and business management. I had uh, upwards of 30 uh, PhDs and masters. We didn't sell any products. We advised uh, farmers on agricultural science, and I was particularly upset uh, at the um, distortions with respect to um, genetically engineered crops and how they were being portrayed by activist organizations. And um, one day I just uh, had enough and uh, <laughs> it was at a rock concert actually. And uh, the uh, rock concert uh, was uh, the, uh, the singer said the next song is about the patenting of life. And and uh, and uh, he went on and on, and I shouted out of the darkness, uh, "You're wrong!" And I stopped the rock <laughs> concert, and uh, and he, and I said, uh, "I know the case that you're referring to." Uh, uh, and uh, he was uh, saying that the farmer was just trying to grow organic canola, and of course Monsanto sued him. And and I said, "You're wrong." And he said, "Well, you don't have the mic." And I said, "Doesn't mean you're right." And we got into it, and uh, that was the that was the moment. That I uh, that I really began uh, uh, my work on trying to educate uh, the broader consumer base on the importance of genetic engineering in agriculture and in food production. And uh, again, uh, I'm agnostic. Uh, I I don't sell these products. I work with farmers every day uh, on a variety of technology integrations. And uh, so I've been involved in producing. Uh, uh, vignettes uh, through No Ideas, K N O W, No Ideas Media, with my son. Uh, I've got a TEDx talk uh, called Will Agriculture Be Allowed to Feed 9 Billion People? And that's been seen 150,000 times. And I've written two books on the topic. So, uh, yeah, I'm engaged. <laughs> so that concert, is, can, can I ask what concert it was? Or? Yeah, it was a Chilliwack concert, and I couldn't believe it. I, I was tweeting that I was at the concert, and and then about a third of the way, he stops the concert, said the next song is about the manipulation of, of life and uh, patenting of life, and of course, uh, this and that, and I just lost it. <laughs> so how far back were you? Well, I, it was about 650 people in the auditorium, and I was midway, you know, it was, it, it was, I was midway in the uh, auditorium sitting on the end seat, and, and uh, yeah, I got into it for about 45 seconds with the guy, and then I got up and left, and people clapped because I was leaving, but uh, the, oh, farm, wow. the farmers in the audience immediately lit up Twitter saying, thanks for sticking up for us, Rob. So that's, wow. when, that's when it began the whole process. 
<laughs> That's hilarious. So there was a there was a story. There was a, a lawsuit. It sounds like that was misunderstood. Or well, yeah, it was. Uh, it goes back to Percy Smeisner and the whole Monsanto. He, Percy claimed that uh, the genetics had blown into his field uh, and that it was 100% accidental. Um, of course, that lawsuit's very famous, and uh, yeah. uh, in the end, um, uh, it was settled. Uh, and uh, uh, there's the details all online, but. Uh, Suffice to say that uh, the 800 acres or so of canola didn't just blow in off the road in straight lines. So it was uh, a long drawn out uh, story. Anyway. <laughs> you know, and I think there's some inherent, I don't know, asymmetries. It's easier to garner fear than it is to eradicate fear. And it's, oh, it's sure. easy to have mistrust in large institutions. These things are almost innate for us nowadays. Yeah. And, uh, you know, in this whole area, I, I should also mention that I have a farm in Uganda and I've been uh, doing a lot of work in Kenya, Uganda and Nigeria and uh, these areas around the world as you travel in agriculture. And I've been fortunate to travel globally. You see the number of places that could benefit from uh, genetically engineered technology um, to make people's lives better and to make agriculture more sustainable and make farmers more profitable. And yet uh, the distortions, uh, the outright lies uh, in, in the marketplace are, are uh, amazing. And uh, it's amazing how quickly you can spin three little letters, GMO, into fear rather than, uh, than to embrace the science that's behind them. So, you know, I've got some talking points, but you're, you're passionate about this. What are, what are the things that are top of mind for you as far as the, the biggest misrepresentations you see right now? Well, the, uh, the, whole, the whole idea that uh, genetically engineered technology is, is just in control of large companies, for one thing, is erroneously wrong. Um, you know, the best example or the first example of genetic engineering uh, making a difference in crops was actually the papaya in Hawaii, where the ring spot, most, uh, the ring spot virus was decimating the papaya. And farmers working in concert with uh, scientists like Dr. Gonzalez uh, of the University of Cornell and, and Washington State, I believe, developed a, uh, 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 using genetic engineering, uh, developed a papaya that was resistant to the ring spot virus and uh, and allows that industry and allows the papayas to exist in Hawaii today. There's a lot of, of a misconception. Uh, the, the idea that genetically engineered crops um, uh, on broad acre agriculture facilitate more, more use of pesticides, more use of active ingredient per acre is absolutely false. And uh, you know needs to be talked about. There's some great success stories out there. The fact that golden rice uh, fortified with uh, beta carotene that would provide vitamin A uh, to uh, to the poorest people on the planet has been sidelined since 2002 by the wow. efforts of people like uh, Greenpeace. The fact that we have uh, the Cavendish banana right now that we all enjoy is is on its knees right now, uh, being hammered by diseases that there are no cures for. The fact that we have oranges in Florida that are being decimated by citrus greening and they're desperate for a genetically engineered cure. The fact that we have uh, eggplant or brinjal in, in Bangladesh that's reducing pesticide or insecticide use by, by 70% on crops. These are all things that people don't understand. Uh, the fact that cassava, uh, we have a cure for cassava disease, uh, Brown Street Mosaic and cassava, the fact that we can cure uh, cigatoga and bacterial wilt and bananas through genetically engineered scientists in Uganda and Kenya working on these problems. Um, nobody, nobody knows this stuff and, and, uh, and the activists sideline all of this stuff. And so it's, uh, it's amazing that, you, you, you know, for as many, as many acres of, of genetically engineered crops that are sown in the world every year, you know, if they were as bad as the activists claim, um, you would surely think that in 30 years of growing these crops, there would be, you know, incidences of this stuff going awry. And these have been some of the most um, amazingly successful integrations of science and agriculture ever introduced. Again, that story is just not getting out. So the, the golden rice, let's go a little deeper in that. Uh, 
the developing world, you know, issues of vitamin A deficiency, blindness. I heard some stat that this can be responsible for a couple thousand deaths per day. Yeah, the uh, you know the uh, the the it's, it's you know round numbers they throw it out there, but half a million deaths, uh, half a million deaths a year. Uh, people wow. go blind every year. Uh, half a million people go blind, and about two hundred fifty thousand deaths. I think are the stats that happen every year. Just round numbers: a hundred thousand here, hundred thousand there. But uh, wow. these are people who die. Uh, these are people who go blind or die because of lack of vitamin A deficiency. You have activists out there who say, well, they should just eat a well-balanced diet. They should just eat more vegetables. Well, they would if they could, but their staple is rice. They eat rice three, four times a day, or or if they're lucky, three, four times, or maybe once a day, and they eat white rice. And if you can have rice that is genetically engineered to be a golden color that is uh, producing beta carotene that'll synthesize vitamin A in the body, I think that keeping that away from people is amoral. And it's, uh, you know, it could have saved millions of people's lives since 2002. And yet, you know, activists campaign against its release because it's some kind of genetically engineered Satan thing. It's bizarre. You know, something I learned recently that surprised me is that the idea of swapping genes from species to species that that plants already do that themselves, that this is not really a new technology. Well, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's nature. Uh, I mean, if you eat, uh, if you enjoy, uh, uh, if you enjoy sweet potato, um, the uh, one of the technologies used in genetic engineering is to use a bacterium called agrobacter bacterium to use that bacterium to transfer genetics from one plant to another. Uh, that is called uh, you could cisgen transgenics or cisgenics. You can move things between uh, plants using agrobacterium. This is old technology, uh, but it is a genetically engineered technology. Well, every sweet potato that you eat uh, has agrobacterium in it. In other words, it's nature's naturally genetically modified crop, and there are many of them showing cross species integration of genetics between species. So this is nothing new to nature. Nature has been doing this a long time. Uh, just with science now, we, we are able to do it much more exact and much more quickly than we've ever done before. Um, so again, these things are, are, are replicated in, in nature. So it's hard to say that there's some, some scary new thing that might cause genetic drifts or genetic insertions or whatnot when this is occurring in our foods already. Well, you know, and I think I'll bring up an example, uh, Alan, that's really amazing. When I grew up, all the grapefruits that we ate were white fleshed, and today they're all red fleshed. And so the question would be, what caused the, the grapefruits to become red fleshed? Well, this was a breeding process called mutagenesis. Mutagenesis is the exposure of seeds to gamma nuclear radiation or the exposure of seeds to carcinogenic chemicals to induce mutations. So what they did was they grabbed grapefruit and they exposed grapefruit to gamma nuclear radiation and scrambled the chromosomal complex of grapefruit. And lo and behold, one of the aberrations that came out of it was a mutation yielding uh, red flesh grapefruit that yielded or resulted in the ruby red grapefruit. That 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 breeding process, Alan, is uh, is accepted by the organic community as okay. You can hmm. randomly scramble the the genetics of plants with uh, exposure to carcinogenic chemicals or nuclear radiation, and that breeding process is okay. But you flick off three genes in, in an apple, and you have an apple called the Arctic apple that doesn't turn brown as quickly, reducing food waste. And that is somehow offside and bad for consumers. Explain that to me. Like this, this is the stuff that drives me insane. How something in a lab that's generated with nuclear radiation could be deemed organic, and you could slap a non-GMO sticker on that grapefruit, and it's legit, and yet you'd flick off three genes in an apple and people lose their mind. So if you do it in purpose in a controlled setting, that's not all right, but just happening haphazardly, that's, yeah. I, I guess, I don't know. And so the, the thing that, that bothers me is that the whole term of GMO is, is it's just a terrible term. Um, 
And it's, it, it kind of describes a whole area of genetic engineering. And if you follow the evolution of plant breeding, whether it's open pollinization, hybridization, polyoid, uh, polypoloid breeding, uh, whether it's mutagenesis, and then you get into the area of transgenic, cisgenics, whether you get into the area of gene silencing, gene editing, or CRISPR-Cas9 or 13, and that's some brand new technology coming out right now, that it, genetic GMO is nothing more, nothing less than an advancement of the breeding process. And people say that we should just label GMOs. Well, it's not an ingredient. GMOs or genetic engineering is not an ingredient. It's a breeding process. And surely to God, if, if you wanted to label, uh, again, Arctic apples that have gene silencing in them, that label them GMO, then don't you think you should label uh, uh, grapefruit that's been generated through mutagenesis nuclear radiation with some sort of a sticker as well? If you're going to label one breeding process, shouldn't we label them all? Hmm. So that's a that's fascinating because that is one debate too as to even independent of the risk or safety, the argument comes up about consumer choice and consumer be, consumers being informed. There's the whole thing about the Safe and Accurate Food Labeling Act, or also called uh, disparagingly called the Dark the Dark Act. So, is there a there's something set to expire in 2022? Do you know about the labeling? How that's changing? Yeah, I do. Uh, see, I I come from Canada, and so Canada has a different registration process than the United States. We have something called Novel Trait Registration, which I think is pretty pretty uh, commonsensical. And that is that regardless of the breeding process, the uh, plant or the new product, new seed to be registered is based, uh, registered on its novel trait. In other words, they go through the safety and assessments and agronomic assessments and, and the, the crop is brought to the marketplace based on novel trait. In the United States, they, they are moving towards a new system where uh, bioengineered um, bio products will have to have a bioengineered label on them. Um, and this is, of course, uh, been brought about as as a result of of pressure from a variety of groups, and um, and so this new label will be coming on to the marketplace. It'll be interesting to see how that label, Alan, affects consumers. Yesterday, I was I'm in the states right now. Yesterday, I bought some some uh, some walnuts, peanuts, and cashews, and I had to buy this package that had a non-GMO label butterfly on it. And it drove me insane because I didn't want to buy this product because there is no such thing as GMO'd uh, almonds, peanuts, or cashews. And yet I was forced to pay extra money for this stupid little butterfly on the label, which to me breathes absolute falsehood and distortion to the consumer. Um, but the the new label coming up in foods, I think, um, It'll be interesting to see whether there's a positive or negative outcome. I think the more consumers actually learn about science, uh, the more this won't bother them. So the butterfly, that was a point I had too. There's an argument about the environmental impact. And I should I should point out that now I'm segueing to glyphosate mm, because sure. in many yeah. cases, arguments against GMO, whenever, whenever they seem to lose momentum, then they say, well, maybe not GMO, but then glyphosate's the concern. Mm -hmm. So- one of the arguments has been that about monarch butterflies, you know, harms to wildlife from glyphosate usage. So what, what are your thoughts about that? Well, first of all, the, the first thing is glyphosate is an herbicide. It's a herbicide designed to control weeds. So it has no insecticidal properties. Um, before we go there, I just want to say one of the biggest success stories in genetic engineering has been the introduction of BT, Bacillus thuringiensis, BT, cotton, corn, and soybean. And what I mean by that, Alan, is BT, Bacillus thuringiensis, is an organic insecticide. Yes, you heard me correctly, an organic insecticide. It's an organic bacterium insecticide. And what scientists did is they grabbed that, those proteins, those cry proteins from uh, Bacillus thuringiensis and put them in corn, cotton, and soybeans. This is the largest success story in genetic engineering by far because it has resulted in the decrease of the amount of insecticides indiscriminately sprayed on crops. So BT or insect resistant crops have resulted in the decrease of insecticide use, huge reductions in carbamates and organic phosphates that farmers would indiscriminately spray on crops. So I wanna say that first because categorically, 
her insect resistant crops are the unsung hero of, of biotechnology. Now, we'll get into glyphosate. So glyphosate is a herbicide and it's designed to, to kill weeds, all weeds, that, uh, because it's an indiscriminate herbicide. Through genetic engineering, we have bred in resistance by the crop. So you can spray the crop with glyphosate um, and that will uh, be resistant to the herbicide while the weeds in the field die. We'll get into the nuances of this in a bit, but that's the broad, that's the broad brush. Now, um, as a result of that technology, um, which is herbicide resistant technology and crops, that technology was so successful and worked so well that farmers used a lot of it. Now it displaced uh, a huge amount of other herbicides that were used in the marketplace. So while the utilization of glyphosate has gone up, the utilization of atrazine, of uh, bromoxynols, of 2,4-Ds, of uh, trifluralins and triolates, all of those have dropped precipitously. So yes, we're using more glyphosate, but we're using a lot less of the other products that are more hazardous to human beings and, and to the environment. So again, a trade-off, risk benefit. Now, to the extent that glyphosate worked so well, farmers don't get paid to grow weeds. They get paid to grow crops. And so as a result of glyphosate being so efficacious in crop production, there's been a reduction in milkweed. Now, milkweed is a is almost a noxious weed for farmers. Milkweed is a bad weed. And, and we have been able to, we've been able to clean up milkweed. And that has, where you do that, reduced the environment for monarch butterflies. So my counterpoint to that is farmers are now starting to seed, uh, uh, seed natural or seed uh, uh, wild flowers and wild species in the areas adjacent to their fields. And to your listeners who are in the urban marketplace, I would say that if you really are concerned about monarch butterflies, farmers don't get paid to grow habitat for monarch butterflies. They get paid to grow crops. But there's all kinds of your listeners that have areas of their, of their lawns or areas of the gardens or areas of the yards uh, or areas in cities that could be planted to milkweed. And that milkweed then would provide species and habitat for the monarch butterfly. So don't lay it all on farmers because the urban sprawl continues and the urban footprint continues. So why don't we just have uh, milkweed corridors for the monarch butterflies that are uh, adjacent or on the edges of urban, uh, of urban um, communities? We could do that. Robert, I want to expand on this because just before we spoke, I, I mentioned to you offline that I wanted to look at some of the stronger arguments against GMO and support those from their best view. And one of the arguments was about really this thing about the butterflies. And the implication that was left was that glyphosate was toxic to butterflies and glyphosate was killing all these butterflies. And that sounds like a pretty strong misrepresentation. It can't be. It's a herbicide. And when you and when you consider something, there's two kinds of toxicities that are really important. One is one is called chronic toxicity, exposure over a long period of time. Think in, think ingestion of arsenic and building up in your body over yep. a long period of time until it kills you. The other one is uh, is uh, acute. In other words, the dose. So LD50, lethal dose to kill 50% yep. of the rat population in the test. So glyphosate has an LD50 of around 5,000. Alcohol is just slightly safer than glyphosate. But when you consider nicotine or aspirin, Caffeine. or when you consider sugar or salt, uh, sorry, salt, or you consider... Uh, aflatoxin, which is naturally occurring in crops, all of those have a, a much lower LD50, which means it kills you quicker than exposure to glyphosate. And your exposure to glyphosate would have to be enormous before you would ever get to levels that are harmful. So these are the kind of statistics and sci science facts that are lost on people. And because glyphosate is a herbicide, it doesn't act on monarch butterflies. It doesn't act on Lapidoptera, Lapidoptera insects. And so uh, the correlation between glyphosate use and monarch butterflies is, is th there's, no, there's, no, there's no connection because it's not an insecticide. 
but the extent to which farmers already wanted to have milkweed off their property, that, that makes sense. And that's, that's a, well, that, 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 that does make sense. Yeah. yeah. And, and the cleaner, the cleaner the crops are over time, the cleaner the crops are, the more yield we get up per acre. That's economically viable for farmers. The less weeds there are in fields, the less you have habitat in those fields for butterflies, bees, etc. Now, bees are something interesting because in Canada, we grow 22 million acres of canola and that canola supports the bee habitat in Canada. So again, and most of the canola that we grow is genetically engineered herbicide tolerant canola, not necessarily to glyphosate, but rather to another product called glufosinate. Again, people don't know that. Um, and, and again, uh, the, it's not all bad news. I mean, there's a lot of good news stories out there, just nobody talking about them. So one point I've heard too along these lines is that perhaps there's not toxicity to humans directly, but there's an argument that the gut flora, that glyphosate can have some unique effects upon the, the microflora of the gut or the, the soils of the, the, the flora of the soils, bacteria of the soils. Any, any comments that way? Or? Well, you know, there's, there, again, th this is, now we're getting to the era of, uh, of uh, I have this study, uh, you have that study, I have this study. To the extent that I, endocrine disruptors or, or, or gut disru disru disruptors due to glyphosate, and then they get into something called the Shikimate pathway right. and the EPS, EPSB, I, I won't comment on that. I, I'm not a doctor, uh, although I, in social media, you get these papers thrown at you, and they're pretty sketchy papers. I mean, there has been no world organization or no registration organization that looks at toxicology that has ever linked glyphosate to anything, including cancer, by the way, which is um, going to fly in the face of what most of your listeners think. Yeah. Um, so there really isn't any, any uh, study that correlates this thing. The biggest study actually on glyphosate exposure was over 44,000 farmers and custom applicators who spray the product. And that was a, a, a big, big cohort study ignored by the IARC, by the way, and uh, that study didn't find any correlation between glyphosate and, and humans in, uh, in, uh, in problems in human beings. Again, I'm a lay person, but pretty deep in, in this area and have done a lot of studying in this area. Um, but I would encourage your readers and listeners, if they are concerned about that, I would go to medical journals, not, not, pay, for, not pay for publication journals, which we have to be very careful of these days. Yeah. So the, the IARC, you know, 2015, the World Health Organization, they had this, they talked about this heightened cancer risk. And that was for, it was for applicators and workers as opposed to the public. But even then, I understand that was quite a controversial move they made. Well, they, they, they didn't, they, the IARC didn't take into account that 44,000 uh, farmer and custom applicator cohort study. They didn't take that into account. And the IRC did something called a hazard assessment. In the same study, by the way, they determined that night shift workers are, uh, that, that night shifts, uh, night shifts also increase cancer and that hairdressing increases cancer. So if you're a hairdresser, you have a higher risk of cancer and coffee. Of course, all of those things were in that same study in that same oh, time. Was also. Yeah, same kind of outcome. The, uh, the, 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 the delineation and the understanding between hazard and risk is important. Yeah. Uh, if, there's a, if there's a pond beside your house, that's a, that's a hazard. You, you, could, you could drown in that pond, but, but the degree to which you will, the risk of you drowning in that pond is really, do you go in that pond? Are you a fisher? Are you fishing on that pond? Do you swim in that pond? With all those activities, the risk goes higher. Uh, but they just did a hazard assessment on glyphosate. In other words, they determined based on a number of pretty sketchy studies that uh, glyphosate is a hazard. And it's interesting to note how the tort lawyers have grabbed onto IARC and really IARC that that one monogram that they did on glyphosate is the only evidence that's used in the California courts right now on the litigation against glyphosate. And it's, it's the one thing, it's the IARC study that they, they clamp onto. And uh, so when you, when you say WHO uh, says, IARC is loosely tied to the WHO, 
But even the WHO has distanced themselves from the IARC ruling on glyphosate. And again, to repeat an earlier statement, even the European registration um, uh, agencies, along with EPA and CFIA in Canada, have concluded uh, that glyphosate is non-carcinogenic. And the EPA just came out with another statement on that. And so did the Canadian Food Inspection Agency in Canada. And my understanding too is that in the realm of herbicides, you mentioned how how yes, glyphosate usage went up, but other more powerful herbicides went down. That there's their net toxicity, but also just the sheer quantity, like the the actual amount of herbicide you need per acre plummeted greatly with the use of glyphosate. Is that is that accurate? That that is accurate. Uh, now I, I want to also say something to the urban audience. When you see a sprayer or an airplane going across the field. And you see that mist coming out of the back of that sprayer. You need to realize that that's water. We, five to 20 gallons per acre of water is being sprayed. That's why you have these big tanks on these sprayers, because sprayers are full of water, not chemical. Um, in the case of glyphosate, you are taking the equivalent of a, of a pop can and spraying that, spreading that pop can over the size of a football field. So it's equivalent of one pop can per acre, the size of a football field, and we use water as a carrier to spread that pop can evenly across the football field. In that pop can is some salts. Those salts are what glyphosate is. Glyphosate is a salt. And we, we are putting on that salt at 554 grams or perhaps 340 grams per acre. And I'll repeat that, 340 grams to 554 grams per acre applied over a football field. This is dramatically lower than when I started my career in agriculture, when we were actually putting pounds on ground and anecdotally, wow. anecdotally in, in cotton production, Alan, they were up to as high as 24 pounds of active ingredient per acre. And now we're down wow. to less than four. Wow. So that's a huge shift. You know, something you said about BT, just to go a little deeper in that. So I, I look quickly. So BT, it's an organic compound, you said. And I understand that that's also used in organic produce, right? That's considered okay for organic, uh, as an organic pesticide. Is, is that correct? Well, that's correct. And again, re, you know, listeners have to think about this. Just because you, you're you going to grow a crop organically without the utilization, and you need to watch for the small print here. They say without the utilization of synthetic fertilizers and without the use of synthetic pesticides which means that you still use pesticides in organic production. You have to. Do you just put a sign at the end of the field and you say, bugs and insects, stay away because this field is organic? Well, of course that doesn't work. Um, so Bacillus thuringiensis is an organic insecticide. So is pyrethrum. Pyrethrum is extracted from chrysanthemums. And chrysanthemums yield this insecticide called pyrethrum. Pyrethrum has a synthetic equivalent called pyrethroid. Now, pyrethroid is used in agriculture as a, a synthetic uh, insecticide, and in organic, we use pyrethrum. Now, the, the kicker here is pyrethrum is actually more dangerous to human beings and to bees than its synthetic counterpart, pyrethroid, because pyrethrum has six esters in it, and pyrethroid has two esters in it. And so when people are buying organic food thinking, that there's no pesticide used in organic food that's absolutely false if you have if you have if you have insects coming in if you have disease coming in uh, there are all sorts of uh, sanctioned and approved organic uh, pesticides that are used now organic farmers do practice more integrated pest management strategies they do practice more crop rotation they do practice more uh, a more integrated uh, cropping. I get that. And, and some of those practices are actually making their way into a broad acre conventional agriculture. So that's a coming together. But to say categorically that organic produce has no pesticide on it is a falsehood. Well, and the, the categorization of pesticides being synthetic or not, is there a clear system or is that more by convention and decision? It, it seems to me like there's not really a hard line for that. Well, if you read the organic, if you read the organic rules, it says that, you know, the, the grower shall use organic pesticides where possible. But if in occasion where there are no organic pesticides available to cure the disease, there may be a relaxation of the rules where he could use a synthetic pesticide in his place. 
Wow. So these things are all um, th these things are all fraught with nuance and the de the devils in the details. Again, with the the non GMO butterfly label, did you know you can have up to five percent GMO in in your product and still call it non GMO, which makes no sense. Uh, so in addition to them slapping that butterfly on spinach or or rice or or cabbage, or water, or salt, where, where there is no genetically modification. Um, they're duping customers. Um, these kind of labels, the, the, the details, like in organic, are in the small print. So if you read the, you know, the, the, re the rules, you know that there is a lot of, um, a lot of, a lot of gray area. You know, and an important point, too, is I've heard just the talk about uh, most of the arable farmable land that we have on the planet is by and large already in use. And with population growing, we've, we've got to have ways to be more effective. What are your thoughts just about some of the more possible benefits in terms of our land utilization, water requirements? I mean, what, what can we look for that way? Well, now, now this is where we really can have a coming together instead of this polarization. I, in, in the book that I wrote, which is called Food 5.0, How We Feed the Future, um, Regardless of the food religion that you believe in, and there's all kinds of food religions, um, but regardless of the food religion you believe in, uh, the one thing we should all agree on is that as long as we have human beings on the planet Earth, agriculture needs to be infinitely sustainable. Would you agree with that, Alan? For sure. Okay. So now, now let's, let's talk about infinite sustainability of agriculture. What would make agriculture infinitely sustainable? Well, the factors would have to be, we'd have to consider soil health as a big, big one, right? Yeah. Okay. So soil health would be one. Water use efficiency would be another one. I think greenhouse gas balance, fair to say, uh, you know, uh, greenhouse gas balance, sequestration and release of, of uh, greenhouses, greenhouse gases from the soil. Um, some people might want to throw in animal welfare into into sustainability. Um, that may not be sustainable or one that may not be a crux of it, but we throw that one in. One that everybody forgets about is farm viability, because if the farmer is not viable, you don't have sustainable agriculture. So that's number one, actually, is farm mm -hmm. viability. So as we start to think about, as we turn the corner in our discussion here, Alan, and we start to look outwards to the future of agriculture, I could give I could give a rip whether it's an organic uh, an organic practice or whether it's a conventional practice. I could give a rip whether it was a, a plant that was generated through hybridization or open pollination or mutagenesis or or CRISPR Cas9. What does that plant? What does that crop do in terms of water use efficiency? Will that this practice, and glyphosate is a great example. Because of glyphosate, we have reduced the tillage on our farms. And in, in most cases, people who are practicing uh, herbicide tolerant crops don't till the land at all. It's called no till, or at the very most minimum tillage. Is it better uh, to till the land uh, three or four times, releasing carbon, releasing nitrous oxide from the soil into the atmosphere? Is, is that better for the planet, like organically tilling the land all the time and breaking down the organic matter and breaking down the carbon? Or are we better off to spray on a pop can of glyphosate break? You're going to be losing the topsoil and harming the microflora and having less, less arable land, I would assume, with extensive tilling. Well, every time we till soil, every time we till soil, we fracture the structure of soil and we, we degrade the soil. We degrade organic matter. So again, you're, you're making the point. So let's have a conversation around agricultural science. And, you know, people who live in the city and are so far removed from agriculture, they all have an impression of a farmer in bib overalls driving a round fendered pickup truck in front of his little red barn. And, and that is such history channel stuff, you know. It's uh, agriculture is so advanced scientifically, it's not even funny. And it's a very, very, it's a very, very, uh, it's a very, very hard business because you're not in control of, of weather. You're not in control of disease and in insects. You have to react in a bad way. I mean, in the right way, just ignorance from a standpoint of not understanding what these sciences are. That's, that's quite, a, quite a thought. <laughs> and if you did that, if you voted 
to ban fertilizer, pesticide, and and genetic engineering and breeding processes. If you if you voted for that, what have you just voted for? If if you if you play the game out where all the activist group win, you win. We just reduce all pesticide use on the planet. Well, the estimates are that almost overnight crop production would drop forty two percent worldwide almost overnight. That would be the the impact of of wiping pesticide use away from farmers. And if you say, well, we'll just eliminate all fertilizer. Well, 50% of the protein in every man, woman, and child on the planet Earth, 50% of the protein in every human being owes itself to nitrogen fertilizer. So which half of the planet should we eradicate? And when then it, when fertilizers, it, fertilizers are used in organic too as well, right? Right, but they're largely manure. So we're using manure fertilizers that come from livestock production. Um, so again, people say we should eat less meat. Uh, we just wipe out livestock production. Well, when you wipe, wipe, out, wipe out livestock production, where did the oh, organic wow. farmers get their manure from for their organic fertilizers? Wow. Are we back to the days of harvesting guano off of the islands of Peru and Bolivia where they had the guano wars? Uh, that's what those wars were all about, harvesting bird poop off of islands so we had enough fertilizer without the... I can't imagine there's more to draw from. Uh, well, th that was all that was all exhausted, right? We exhausted millions of years of deposition in a few short years. And, and then mankind was on a precipice where we couldn't fertilize crops until the Haber-Bosch process came along that turns inert nitrogen that we breathe in with every breath, 78% nitrogen turns it into fertilizer. Without that invention, which I think is the most important invention in mankind right now, is the Haber-Bosch process. And nobody knows about it, but that's that to me is the most important invention in, in human history because it keeps everybody alive. Hmm. This is this has been incredible. Um, what other other points you'd like the audience to be aware of? You know, anything we, we've not we've not covered or you wish to address? Or? Well, I, I just think that we need to have a, a a more nuanced conversation. I mean, for people to be preaching that agriculture needs to be sustainable. And these, these people are preaching to farmers that have been farming the land for 100 to 150 years. Like if, if you have a business in a city that's 100 years old, you would say that that business is remarkable. I know lots of farmers, Alan, that are century farmers have been farming that land for 100 years in their family or 150 years in the United States. These people know an awful lot about sustainability. And mm. yet we have all sorts of pre people preaching regenerative agriculture and agroecological agro agriculture and organic agriculture. And at the end of the day, isn't it really about agriculture being infinitely sustainable? Isn't it the important thing is long-term soil health? Isn't the important thing increasing water use efficiency? Isn't the important thing reducing greenhouse gases from agriculture overall, isn't those aren't those things important? And they so are, that was for me know. that was a shocking realization was to see that a lot of these practices that you know many advocate for would be less land efficient and less resource efficient. They would actually set set us the wrong way as far as our environmental goals. If we move to all organic production because of the yield drag of organic production, we would have to cultivate another one third more acres to achieve the same yield. That's the benefit. That, 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 that is not a goal. big an impact. Yeah. Hmm. This is this has been fascinating. So food food 5.0. I'm going to have some links up to that, and also the. I'm sorry. What was the no website again? K N O W. No no ideas media. K N O W. No ideas media, and that's on YouTube and Facebook. And yep. uh, I think there's a website there. That's my son runs that. Uh, Nick Syke. And uh, also my website is robertsyke.com. S-A-I-K. You know, a little more, just a little more story about how I got interested in this as a different view. I was reading a fair amount about just, just toxicology and looking at, you know, whether it's organic or synthetic or not, if you want to know if something is safe or not, you've got to have some, some metric and the dosage has to be relevant. You know, how much is there? And I came across the process by which the whole dirty dozen list is formed. And I was surprised to learn that the actual dosage was not really a big part of that. And I, I came to realize, well, go ahead. Yeah, if, 
at, if you look at No Ideas Media and you go to uh, if you go to the uh, the uh, YouTube site and you look at the video there, glyphosate in in Cheerios, uh, the section that Nick did there, it is an absolute stark revelation of how the environmental work came up with environmental group came up with their numbers. It's bizarre, and you got to remember that the environmental group is largely a front for a whole bunch of organic companies. And, and Nick talks about that. It's an eight minute eye opener. So I would, if there's one video you could watch, go to No Ideas Media and hit videos and then search out the one on glyphosate and Cheerios. It's uh, amazing. Yeah, I'll get that. I'll get that there for sure. And I guess part of the realization too is that so an argument I hear is that, well, yes, but you can measure these things in people. You can measure the fact they have these pesticides and you can measure them in the food. And I've come to realize that our ability to measure has gone far beyond the the, the relevance. You know, we, we can measure things in amounts that may not be important anymore. Well, a uh, part per million is one second in 28 days, I think. And a part per billion is one second in 32 years. So people wow. get freaked out when you see something at, um, you know, 200 parts per billion. Well, 200 parts per billion is nothing. It's nothing. And uh, it's it's like a one second in 32 years. That's a part per billion. And just because we can measure it, and now they're measuring in parts per trillion, like really, like we have to understand that um, there is a risk benefit. And I think that's one of the things that's really going out the window is the understanding of risk benefit, the precautionary principle that says, you can't bring anything to the marketplace unless you can prove it's safe is scientifically impossible because it's a double negative and you cannot prove that something is safe. It's impossible to prove that. So therefore, if you run your registration or your or leg, your, your legalization process is based on a precautionary principle, you've damned yourself because there's nothing that you can prove that's safe. Well, and the tough part too is then the next thought process is that pesticides are still used in organic compounds and further yet, pesticides are naturally occurring in plants. You know, I saw the 1990 paper arguing that plants might produce 10,000 fold the pesticide load that we would ever put on top of them. 90%, 99% of all of, I think there's a guy, I forget his name now, produced a paper on that. 99% of all the the pesticides you ever eat are produced by plants themselves, like crops produce nicotine to ward off uh, ward off insects, and they produce all sorts of, of uh, that's how they fight. Uh, they produce pesticides, and again, people are aware of that. Well, Robert, this has been super enjoyable. I appreciate your time. We'll get this data out, and you know, and thank you for taking your time to just help help inform the world. This is an important topic. Well, thanks for thanks for taking the time. And if you want to do a follow up, I am sure that when you post this, you are going to be inundated with that psych is a shill. That psych is bullshit. This is wrong. That's wrong. You are going to get all sorts of that. I bet you this will be one of the most lit up comments area that you've had in a long time. You know, thank you so much. I will hold on to comments and feedback and I'd love to do a follow up if, that, if that's Let's an do option. That. Let's do a follow up. You can you can grab you can grab a bunch of the comments, and uh, I'll do my best to answer them. You know, I've got connections with a few people who are advocates as well. I'll even reach out to them and get some of their best sides, and we'll talk through it. All right, on. Thank you. Hey, Dr. Christensen here. Thanks so much for joining me for another episode. Is there a topic you'd like me to cover? I'd love to hear from you. Just go to Dr. Alan Christensen on Facebook or Instagram. Write your question and use the hashtag Medical Myths. Did you find this show helpful? If so, please take a minute and leave us a rating on iTunes so that others can know. Thanks much. I'll be back with you real soon. Bye-bye.